we're, we're constantly looking for ways to communicate the gospel in ways that not church people could understand. I mean, we're not a seeker sensitive thing necessarily, but um, I'm always intrigued by by that. Um, um, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm a weird guy in some ways. I feel like I've never <coughs> intentionally tried to tailor, like per, particularly the preaching, to a certain cultural reality. But I feel pretty integrated, like like I'm pretty aware of my own stuff. I'll say that's a safe way to call. Um, and and I, I think it brings kind of a, a reality that that wherever people are, they, they kind of engage. I think uh, one cultural thing that I've noticed, and this isn't outside the culture, in the church culture, um, one of the shifts that, that I've been aware of of late is, is is kind of a polarization of people in the church. Where, and I don't know if it's down here, I don't know if it's a cultural thing where I'm at and not where you are, but um, people, I've been in one church for 30 years, so there's been quite a journey, and there have been some people who have been with me for a very long time, and it's been a weird thing in the last few years, I've been noticing some people who, 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 like, wow, if you don't say it just right, they, they get really afraid, and they leap. Uh, you have to say it just right, and it can't be wrong, like theology police, kind of thing, and, um, I find it really, we don't have any of that here. It's very, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's the most, I can't stand being around. It's like religion's all over it. I just, I, it just feels like I'm caught a lot of things here. And I'm just a guy, I don't, you know, I, I'll, I like saying it wrong just if it will get you away from me. <laughs> Not even make me mad, just go away. I don't want to, just, yeah, so. I've noticed that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I'm answering that question very well. But anyway. yeah. um, talk a little bit about um, the sort of the high point. If you look back over 30 years of ministry, is there one point you think, man, we, things were just we were really in the sweet spot in uh, our church at this time. Uh, we were really in all God has called us to be in this time. The high point. Of well, I could talk about high point, but when you said it that way, we were all the guys. No, I don't know. There's not everybody. No. Uh, no, 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 no. Honestly, there isn't. There are there are times and seasons that I really enjoyed, um, but I, I honestly, I'm not trying to be uh, humble or uh, no. There, there I because I, if 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 you knew like our story, our church's story, you'd be saying, well, why don't you tell them about the time when. We were around like 6,000 people and our church was growing like crazy. We were um, um, in a newspaper. Uh, we, it was at the time, again, this is a long period of time. I've been here 30 years, so uh, 12 years into my time there, we were a church that started in a small little building and it, it, and it expanded. So we were meeting in a school and meeting in a gymnasium. And we had three services in a gym, and nobody was doing that kind of thing then. And so a lot of attention, around 6,000 people. And if you were out here and you knew me and, and you just asked about the high point, you would say, hey, talk about that. I hated that time. I almost lost my life during that. If that was the high point, that was a low point. That high point was a low point for me. So if I were to talk about, so that wouldn't be the high point for me. So I don't know. I don't know how to answer the high point. It's, it's, um, there are seasons when I feel like um, uh, the staff's on the same page. No, those are sweet. Um, but I feel like generally the people are are, are really, really moving with what we mean by what we say, not just what we say. I don't know if you've been in ministry for a long This is a very discouraging thing. And maybe you've already felt this too. I, <laughs> I'll have this experience where I'll preach something and whatever it is. And somebody will come up to me and, and, and say, and I'm not going to mention any name, but that's, that's, you sound just like, and I'll name somebody, and I'm going, that was, I think, exactly opposite of what the person, and what people hear, and what you say, it's not the same, mm -hmm. and so, but there are seasons where it feels like, you know what, I think there's a sense of moving in the same direction. I, I've, I'm in a place right now where the thing I'm most encouraged by is, is what, what I experience in the staff. 
Um, those are my closest relationships. Those are the people I feel most accountable with. They're the people I trust the most. That, and, and maybe that speaks to community. Uh, um, because that's, that's, that's where I know what's going on and whether we're together or not. Um, and you know, we have people in groups and, and all sorts of things. But I don't, and I, and I have a sense of things in the congregation. Um, but I don't always know. So, but the low point would be, it's funny because the low point, um, well, I was telling you before we came here that about 16, 17 years ago, 12 years, I'm, I'm doing the masters, but 12 years into my time at Liverpool, we were the first church of what's happening now, I was exploiting positive things, and I just hit the wall. Uh, I came up exhausted, um, emotionally drained. Um, uh, some day that, that I, 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 I came up with this theory that you couldn't be the senior pastor of a mega church and a healthy person at the same time. That you had to pick. Either I'm going to be the senior pastor of this huge church or I'm going to be healthy. I can't do both. And that made me really angry. And I'm, I'm not trying to be smart or goofy here. I was really angry. Um, in fact, one of the things that let me know something was really wrong was I, I took a week after Christmas. I took a week and a half of vacation. We didn't go anywhere, I just stayed home. And about three days into my vacation, my wife goes, what is the matter with you? We're on vacation and you are so crappy. And, and what dawned on me was when I was on vacation, being on vacation was the only time, this is gonna sound sick, that dials right into spiritual formation. Because being on vacation was the only time I had time to actually think about my life. And when I had time to think about my life, I hated it. <laughs> I did, and that's when, and then I went into counseling. Went, went into counseling because I, I just I actually went into counseling to go. I need, I need to know if I can stay in the ministry because I wasn't sure I could because I really did want to have a life. And um, and then, and then one, one, one day, a few months into that, the counselor said, you know, we should bring your wife in here sometime. And I thought that was a great idea because she's really messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Get off the missile, help everything. <laughs> And I'm giving you the snapshot here. We, you know, it was incredible. And then we went into marriage counseling, and we, it, it became that. And I, I really entered into a season of seeing how. I mean, we were both of us. If my wife is sitting here, we would talk about how neither one of us uh, were. Our marriage was intact, but um, I had no idea how self-absorbed I was. I mean. Um, and the reason is because I'm so absurd. That works. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, um, no, I honestly went into some um, real deep seasons without going into all the details. I wouldn't mind telling you anything we still have time, but um, a real repentance uh, that I did not love my wife. I love me. And uh, did a lot of God stuff because of me. And, so that's, you know, I, I hope everybody, I hope everybody faces that stuff down still there when you start to, you know, really get hold of what is really driving you. And it's not all God. <laughs> not even close, usually. And, and, and that, that was the season where I had to, I kind of dug all that crap up. And, um, and I've been great ever since. <laughs> No, he my counselor I called him, but, but what I loved about him was no, he wasn't intimidated by me at all. He went after me. He loved me. But he just knew I was a little crap. Yeah. Yeah. And he is he's the original big actually. <laughs> <laughs> Get it? Yeah, I mean, okay. you, you didn't miss me on this. So, um, <laughs> I grew up on a racetrack. You don't know what this is. So. Um, okay, so uh, how did the church go through that? Did the church go through that with you? Or did you, when that low point, were you pretty open about things? And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I took a sabbatical, like a three month sabbatical. And the church really did go through it. I mean, because it wasn't just me. I mean, it really, as an organization, uh, I, I kind of describe it as a time um, we needed uh, that that um, every every incompetency. This is this is I told you the personal stuff. This is more the church stuff. But every incompetency as a church that we thought we could ignore because we were growing so fast came and bit us in the butt. Say, no, you can't get away with it. You, you have to pay attention to this. 
Um, and um, it just felt like the wheels were falling off. There were three, I described it to our people, I described it like if we were an ocean liner out in the middle of the ocean or like a cruise ship, we got hit with three torpedoes. And I can think one was adultery in the staff. Ah, oh, that was the whole the boat. Um, one was, uh, one was, maybe they don't matter, but there were three big events that, that and, and when, what I described, the way I described to our church is that when you get, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, and you get hit with three torpedoes, you're not, you're not wondering where you're going anymore. So talk about vision in our church. Ah, I, I, we're really wondering if we're going to survive. We have a lot of work to do to patch these holes up. And there's something in the suit here that's wrong. Um, I mean, I really, it really, without getting into the details, I really, um, I'm right in the middle of all this other personal stuff that's going on. I'm going, this ministry is not producing good stuff. I don't like the product. Um, and, and maybe telling you about adultery of the staff would be enough to tell you that something's wrong. <coughs> um, that was just symptomatic of uh, some other things, too. And um, so what about the message? Uh, it has to go deeper. That was where we really began to dive into things like spiritual formation and the big crowd. I don't I don't trust the crowd. I don't hate the crowd, but I don't trust it. I'm not, I'm not just because it's full doesn't jazz me. It is full, but it doesn't. I just don't know what it means. It means something. I just don't know what it means. Um, and don't be assuming that uh, it's good. I don't want to assume it's bad. But anyway, so we, we um, but I, I remember using that analogy. But the other thing that I told our church, in fact, now when I do vision talks, um, anybody who was an open door at that time, I, I, they tell me what, remember that the mantra in that day, uh, during that season was open door, grow up or die. And I, I would preach that. You know, grow up or die. We need to grow up personally, spiritually. We need to grow up emotionally. We need to grow up organizationally. And if we don't, okay, but this is over. This this church is over. And um, uh, and so we did that on a number of levels. And one of the levels was me going to counseling, and they all knew. It. Oh yeah, they would they would know. I asked Dave and Bonnie are in counseling, and Dave's only Bonnie gets fixed. <laughs> <laughs> And my bad for life. You just can't do this. You can be silly to the run. There's a woman rolling her eyes behind everybody here. Well, let's, let's open it up to questions. Um, I'm sure you've got many questions, so let's, let's go ahead and get started. Some questions. Hey, thanks for your camera. Yeah. How many of those problems do you think were related to size? that you grew big, and apparently you didn't have a policy against that, saying, Let, let's plant a bunch of churches and stay at 400 or stay at 1,000 or something. How, how much of that do you think was a byproduct of a vision which included size as being at least potentially a good thing? And I heard your caveats there. Well, I think, I think size was part of the problem. I had no paradigm at the time for another way. You know, I, I would not, but I, I, um, I think size, it got, it got way bigger than anything we could manage. And, and, and it's weird, you know, when we were in it, it didn't feel, we felt like something was happening that we didn't understand. Like, I, you know, if somebody had, why is this church growing? I don't know, there's worship and preaching and people are, and there was a, there was a real focus on healing. I mean, we were, we were uh, in inner healing. I mean, we were really dealing with issues of breaking the silence on alcoholism and abuse and things that at the time a lot of churches weren't talking about. So grace was, was huge. And, and so there were some things like that. But uh, in terms of really being able to have any sense of how to come around this huge crowd of people and get them into community, I, I just had no clue at all. And, and the idea of, of and I'm just gonna. I don't think I can do any good unless I'm just totally honest. Because the the, um, the idea of, of planting a church, which would make a lot of sense, you get this big. You talked about the bench where you are of leadership is really big. It it wasn't good or bad. A lot of it was built on the preaching. And then that is that's all. I think I'm so great. I don't think I'm that great. But but a lot of it was. It, and that was part of what sucked the life. We we had a thing where people would call the church, and if I wasn't preaching, they wouldn't come. And, and that must make you feel great. That makes me feel tired. And it's different now. But in those days, it was like, 
it was like this thing had happened. It was wonderful, I guess. But um, I, I described, I can still see this in my mind, sitting in this gymnasium on the front row, on the side of the bleachers, and in the middle of the chairs, and the stage is here. And I would sit, stand here while worship was going on. And all these people had their hands up and were worshiping is so wonderful. And all I could hear was this incredible sucking noise, sucking the life out of me. It was really, really out of balance that way. Um, and. Uh, I, I wonder sometimes if I would have gone into ministry with some of the paradigms even that, that I see emerging now, even like what Faith Fitch is, is, is doing at your church, what different arenas I would have gone to um, or, 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 or models I would have embraced. Because the one thing that was weird, even when I talked about my story like this call, there's this one thing I felt like I knew how to do, I could preach. I didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> so I just preached my guts out. and, and um, and it creates some good things and some really unhealthy things. And uh, I don't know if I answered your question. No. Okay. okay. Thanks again for sharing. I actually have uh, two questions if that's sure. allowed. Um, <laughs> uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, the, first, the first question is seeing as how you went to um, pastor so early, what were some of the things that you wished you had known beforehand that you know now? And the, uh, the second question is in hindsight, looking back on some of the issues with the churches and grew. What were some of the warning signs that you can perceive now uh, that you guys just weren't necessarily aware of in the middle of it all? Let me go to the first one, the second question first, the warning signs that I, we, this is all, probably going to sound weird to you, because, but it'll, it'll explain me to you and even my era, if you will. But I, when, when I was, I, I almost demonized organization. I, that probably sounds stupid to you, like who would do that? Um, when I was in seminary, um, the big thing that everybody was talking about was church growth. And it was like, um, and, and I remember being in these classes and things like that, and, and where, and not, not even just classes, but all the hot seminars was, were about the five things you, should, you can do organizationally to make the church grow, and it sounds, Arrogant. I didn't think it was arrogant. I thought it was just a passion I had for God. I didn't want, I almost, I, I wanted to be part of something that in 10 years that we would look back, the only explanation for why it grew was God. Okay? That honestly was my heart. But what that meant was anything that was organized was unspiritual. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we were unorganized. <laughs> and very spiritual. <laughs> And you know, I just I needed another pair. And finally, I did get a pair of them. And it was the white skin and the wine. And um, what dawned on me was was that if you don't have appropriate skins, organization, you you can have all sorts of wine, but it's going to spill all over the floor. And I that was I was a really hard lesson of um, doing, you know, kind of coming back. And, and then and then the, the tangible thing I did was began to look for recognizing that I have no gifts in that arena. And I kind of knew you bring some people around you. Began to look for someone, an executive pastor, who with me could kind of pastor the church and and pull some of that stuff uh, in. I, I think if I was to do it over Cali, it's hard to be different than I am. And so I know that, that um, and I kind of feel this almost a responsibility, if you have a capacity to come Proclaim and teach. I'd have to do it in some way. I would have to do it, and um, but it's almost like I would go slower. I would go slower. I don't know. But as I'm trying to be honest with you, I don't know how to have done that. Um, I think if if I were starting out now, I, I I don't know that I would put as much weight on the preaching as I do and have. Um, I think issues of social justice are much bigger to me now than they were when I started. It wasn't even on the, wasn't even on the radar screen how we, how we can uh, get involved in our community, those kinds of things. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I'm answering your question very well. Going around and around here. You're doing well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you once again. Sure. I'm a Nigerian student here, and um, I just want to uh, uh, go on on the same topic of church growth and size. 
uh, my denomination back home in Nigeria. I've been experiencing a lot of church growth. Church is growing, and, but I sense a deep crisis that is going to emerge from that soon because uh, with size comes a lot of complexity. Uh, I just want to ask you, what, how, does, how should church leadership respond to size? And uh, or what, what, how, how should church leadership reinvent itself to prepare for the challenges of science? Or, or like you said, if they don't, if church leadership are not well prepared, they're going to cave in, and the whole uh, ship is going to uh, sink. So I, I just, I want to hear your thoughts about that because I think that's a, a particular problem uh, we are facing back home in Nigeria, even as a country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the first thing I think of there, and it's not an organizational answer because I'm not, I'm not, that's not where I'm good, but <clears throat> honestly, if, and you are ministry people, if, if I were across the table from a senior pastor who was going through size, my biggest, how should you prepare for size? I, I would be, my biggest concern would be for your actual life, for the, the pastor's actual life. Before you worry about how to minister all these people, um, one of the biggest things when we hit the wall was was um, recognizing that uh, how, how, do I, how do I say that? Oh, here I am, this pastor. I'm calling all these people to life in Christ, and the truth is, um, you wouldn't want my life because my life sucked. <laughs> Can you say that word? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the limit, though. <laughs> Church that really mitigated against church growth. 
Um, can you tell us about some of those things? I mean, wasn't there a point in which you guys were purchasing some land, we're going to build a building, and I mean, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was one of the torpedoes. We purchased some land, and again, at the time, we're in this, um, you know, the mindset was, well, if you have this big a crowd, you make room for a bigger crowd. I mean, that's just what you do. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, we had purchased some land at, in, in an area close to where we were renting the school. And um, and then this adultery staff said, hit and, and some other things, my, my own personal kind of, I don't know, thing. And I remember getting in front of the church and just saying, you know, I, I know what it feels like to be in something where God's on it. And then we're, we're, we're God just on it, and he, I, we don't believe that God is on it. It's time to just say time out, time out. And so we said no to that. We sold the land and said we are, and in fact, it was part of the grow up or die message. We're not mature at all. We're, we're not mature enough to, it's almost like a, a family that when you go from renting an apartment to owning a home, I mean, you don't have to own a home, but there's almost like a, I said, grow up a little bit. You can't be to do that. And we just said, we're just not, we're, we, we have some work to do before we do that. And so it kind of, if anybody who was around Open Door at the time, because it was like the flavor of the month, I was talking about, I think churches kind of go through that sometimes, where they're the flavor of the month, and they're the hot church town. <clears throat> well, people who were kind of coming around because there was a buzz about Open Door, when, when we just kind of as leaders said, you know what? Getting bigger and bigger, I don't even have another plan right now, but that doesn't, we're not adding service, we're not, we're not, we dial the whole thing down in a, in a pretty big way. And also, I mean, we did start calling for, um, you know, I mean, I didn't have this quote then, but this will illustrate what we started. I mean, Ron Sider in his book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, says that most evangelical Christians are no different than the world in three pretty significant areas, or maybe it's four, but well, one is, their sexuality, um, their their marriages, uh, the divorce rate among evangelicals, according to him, was higher than it is in the in the, um, in the culture. Racism uh, is no better among evangelical Christians, and what, how much they give. And um, if that's true, maybe it's not. But if it's true, you know, we have a problem. I mean, I mean, there's no there's no difference. And when I started talking that way in our church, we had we had some people. Um, this is so hard because I'm trying to give you. The story of our church and kind of the DNA. It's like probably trying to take a drink of water from a fire hydrant here because the early days it was part of what was so healing for people was this message of grace. And then I started saying, you know, grace, grace, you guys, is not the mattress at the bottom of the cliff. So when you jump off the cliff like an idiot, that it's going to, you know, break your fall. No, you're going to get hurt. Some of you might die. And this isn't graceful anymore. See ya. <laughs> I don't know if this is describing it very well, but those are the, those, those, honestly, those are the kind of journeys that that, that um, we would be on, and um, people would leave. I, I take great comfort, you guys. From there's this, there is this pattern in Jesus' ministry where I mean, it happens. I thought I was going through a gospel recently, and I saw it again where where he would do his deal, and multitudes would come, and then he would say something that kind of clarified what he meant by what he said. Whatever it was, they would go ah. See ya. <laughs> and many, you know the pattern, many would even withdraw, would even clarify what he meant by his mission and his message. And it wasn't what they wanted. And I've just, just, just seen that over. It's so weird to be in one church for 30 years to see this kind of, all right, here we go again. Yeah, oh, yeah, I've seen this before. Oh, different face, different reason. Yeah, now I'm a heretic for this reason. Never do. Anyway. <laughs> Does it make any sense? I feel like I'm being weird. <laughs> Are there any challenges that you've experienced from being in a church for a long time? Say, now that I've been here for like 30, 35 years, 30 things, yeah, things that are hard now that maybe weren't as hard when you had only been there for five years. Well, yeah. Yeah, but that, the 30 year thing is a, is a weird thing. Even to me, and I get it, you know. Um, um, but, and I'm not feeling this right now, but one of the things that I've identified as being really hard about a 30 year thing, and, and I've, I've come up just going, oh God, I want to get out of here. I just want to get out of here. Is when, 
when you've been somewhere for 30 years, things that happened, happened before. Can we get over this? How come this thing, like, like, uh, like a, okay, a broken relationship. I tell you this, the hardest thing <coughs> um, relative to well, just kicking the gut, I don't want to do this anymore. Our relationship every Every pastor becomes through that when we pass one point. That's what they say. Broken relationship with best friend who isn't anymore, your best friend, um, somebody on staff who, you know, you work side by side, and then there's a parting ways. Or, or my, my wife in particular um, has had, uh, we've had this, and, and again, it's not happening right now, but <clears throat> one of the patterns, and we're just kind of like this, are people who want to be close to me so they get close to her in order to get close to me? And my wife is, is, is she can imagine, she, well, maybe don't imagine, but she's not uh, as public a person as I am. And she's intensely loyal. She's an incredible lady. Um, but she's been used many times by people. And um, when they didn't get what they wanted, all of a sudden they hate her. Or, or when, when somebody's mad at me and they're mad at her. Um, and when those things just go, oh, here we go again. Here's another relationship that goes down. It would, I, I sometimes fantasize about just going to another church so we would have that problem for the first time, not for the 20th time. And um, I don't know, that, that really has been a hard thing for 30 years. So there are some pluses. I mean, I, I, my kids, I don't, even know, I don't even know if my kids know um, how unusual it is for pastor's kids to have all gone to the same school their whole life. You know, and all, they all went to the same church you know, their whole life. Because I think you know a lot of pastors move around. You, you can survive that, but I mean, I think that was cool. And the other thing that's really good now, um, I'm 58 years old, and um, we now have a second voice, and the guy may be my successor. We talk openly about the possibility of that. Um, but there's this weird thing. I hold the story. Our, our, and I don't know if every church has this, but our church has a story. Um, and, and people in our church are kind of aware. There's this journey. The open door is continually on. And even... Even now, as we're moving into some new things, and quite frankly, some of the new things for us are issues of social justice and stuff like that. And, and so, oh, you're vegan? You're liberal now. Yeah, we're all Democrats. And, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway um, um, that's one of those words you can't say. I know. That's not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but the, the, what's, what's the same about our church is that Anybody who's been in the journey with us will go, oh yeah, we've been on journeys like this before. Where it's God bringing us into a new thing, and it's new, and it's scary, and we're not leaving who we've been, but we're, we're pressing into some new things that are uncomfortable. And being at that church for 30 years, um, there are, it's, every once in a while, I'll, we'll have a talk. I don't know if it's a vision talk or, or not, but I'll, you know, the message team, the guys I, uh, not the guys, the guys, men and women that are with in the message team, would just go, that's a talk only day could that was Dave's talk. Nobody else could do that talk about all the story. So that's a plus. But, um, and you know, I never set it as a goal. Um, my dad was a pastor. He had two churches in his life. And so, you know, obviously there's something in me that would value that. I value the long term thing. But, uh, yeah. I, I, honestly, I, there's times I go, the 30 year thing is a noble thing, and the 30 year thing is because you're chicken. You just, you just don't want to try anything new. And you, just, you know, you complain about this, but at least you know it. I have to, I actually joke about that. I go, yeah, I could, I could go somewhere else, but I expect any other church I go to would have the same kind of problems. And I know where the restaurants are in my neighborhood, so I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have a mechanic, and I know where to get my car fixed, so uh, whatever. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about the pastor's family. Um, uh -huh experience in being a pastor's kid and also being a pastor with children. Um, you know, what kind of things have you or your wife done to you know, really build spiritual formation into your children while you're balancing this huge responsibility as being a pastor of the church? So what, what kind of things do you do with your kids you know, when they're little, when they're teenagers, you know, when they're together with your wife? Just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. It. First thing that came to my mind when you said that was, um, we worked really hard, and I, and I don't know if it's because I was a pastor to myself, um, but we worked really hard to um, 
shield our kids from, did I go off here? But shield our kids from uh, other people's expectations. Like there was, they were supposed to somehow be better than every other kid because they were the pastor's kid. And um, it was really important to me that our kids, uh, I got pretty feisty about that. Um, and um, it's, this is one weird thing about being in a bigger church. In some ways it helped. I don't know. That is my read. It helped me in a bigger church because our kids were just a lot of the kids. And they were good. And, um, I, used to, I used to joke with the kids, though. I said, my, my kid, they're great. They're all grown. I mean, they have kids of their own now. And, and, but they all went through their goofy stuff, embarrassing stuff. My, 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 son, we were, my wife and I were on a missions trip. They came back from a missions trip. And, and the guy who took care of our kids, my son was, I think, 13, 12, 13 years old. And they call us over and they say, so, yeah, we have, Caleb has to tell you something. And he got picked up by the cops for stealing some stuff at a, at a convenience store. And he ended up in a backseat of a cop car. And uh, I remember, I remember because he did that, we had to go to the Brooklyn Park Police Department. And for four Saturdays in a row, I had to go with my son to this class that was designed to scare the bejeebers out of him so they wouldn't do it again. <laughs> and and so, so here I am in this, this pastor's church. And uh, people know me and I don't know them. And so I'm going to this class. Off of these juvenile delinquents, my Sunday one. <laughs> <laughs> this guy comes up to me and says, Pastor Dave. I go, Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Are you teaching a class? I go, No, my kid is. No, <laughs> 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 so actually, he, he had to do this evaluation with this counselor guy, and, and he comes out and he goes, He asks him all these questions, and Caleb says, what, what was that about? What, why did you do all that? He says, well, he wants to know if you're a, if you're a juvenile delinquent or just stupid. <laughs> and it turns out you're just stupid, <laughs> which is really good news. Anyway, but, 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 but actually, no, honestly, to not hide that, to not, I didn't overreact to that. We just, you know what? Yeah, you're a goofy kid. We love you like crazy, but you're an idiot. And to, we, we tried really hard to treat them. I didn't put pressure on them, like, you have to look good for us. I just didn't do that. And I don't know how to I don't know how to make someone do that. I don't but I didn't. I just wasn't embarrassed by my kids. Even when they screwed up. I mean, yeah, I was, but I didn't. The other thing was, and this is true, when I talked I talked about the women in the council, because I could tell you about what we did with our kids and all the reading books and whatever. Um, our whole family changed with my wife and I went to council. And so and we just you know, I'm not aware of these big, huge issues, but all of a sudden, they're there. And one of the things that um, both my wife and I talk about a lot is how somehow the temperature in our home changed when Bonnie and I dealt with some of the unspoken issues in our marriage, and that had a profound effect on our kids. Our oldest daughter was really angry, just an angry kid. I remember, I still have this picture in my mind of her looking through her veins one day, and she was 13, 14. She said, you will never know me. It was a devil voice. <laughs> she was so angry. I, you know, I, I don't ever remember, like, trying to become a better dad. Uh, we, we, she changed when we changed. I, I'm not telling you, I, it sounds like a cliche. Do your marriage, you guys. Do your marriage. And um, we, I, I tell you, you know, we really did, even when we were screwed up. When our kids were little, we would leave them. We'd do three-day getaways to, you know, just be alone, we Bonnie in. Are you all married here? <laughs> yeah, so I have to talk, I talk about sex and stuff. Because you want these breakaways to catch up with all that stuff. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I remember. Wow. <laughs> seems to have been in the driver's seat all these years. What, what's that like? 
what was the, what do you struggle with, what do you have to do to get people more interested, more active, more excited about reaching out socially? Well, in a situation like ours, you kind of have to, we staff for it. Um, we have Metro Impact, like a whole, uh, people who really kind of focus on helping us. I say, I, well, then you end up preaching on it. I mean, you start talking about, when you start dialing into this, and all of a sudden, it's almost embarrassing how I haven't seen before these overwhelming, um, the voice of the prophets caring about the poor. How did I, how, how come I'm not upset about this? Um, and um, so, uh, clearly, I, I think it comes through the pulpit. And that, in our church, that, that's always kind of been this drumbeat. The pulpit isn't the only thing that matters, but it's been this drumbeat and it sets its own. But um, off, uh, also, in tangible ways, to staff for that relative to um, having somebody whose who's real job is just to mobilize people and help our people. We're a kind of a suburban church. We started in the city and found this. It's kind of on the outer ring type of thing because that's where we found this place to go. Um, but I think people really have a heart to be involved in that way, but don't know how. And um, we've, I, I'll be real honest, one of our struggles is we, we have a lot of young people on our staff who are incredible. I just love how they think. And they live in the city, uh, and they live there, they're up, up to, but it's like, is there, one of our struggles is, is there, is there, is there, is there, are there a few steps between actually living with the homeless and becoming homeless yourself, <laughs> joking, and, and helping people to know what are some, some, what are some real steps that people can take to move a little bit closer and get a little more access and have a little more experience that would open their heart a little wider to maybe the next step. We haven't always done well. We, we, it's almost like it would be like social justice the way we've sometimes done small groups. Let's go from a room of 6,000 people to uh, let's four people and be intimate now. Tell me all of you know, it's like there's some steps between that and we've been struggling with how to do that. And I don't, yeah, I don't know that we always do well, but we're getting better. But, so, yeah. Okay. I got room, I have time for one more question. A, a couple of important moments in your conversations that you've talked about uh, the importance of community, whether that be more than preaching or uh, efficiency of a large church. I was wondering if you could clarify more um, when you refer to the community, what you're talking about, and why you think it's so important in a healthy church. Well, when I, okay, I'm not, let me just talk as me, like Dave, because for me, community, it's, I would rather use actually the word relationship. And people that, who, who really know me, and um, I know them, and um, intentionally, uh, uh, that that we are living open faced, um, and there's a number of levels that I lived that out, and um, and I think let me finish my thought. I may be me. Did you know that? Oh, that's a big surprise. Just so you know, it's like bounce all over. But um, I, I have a group of guys I meet with on every Friday at two o'clock um, at my house. Um, A.M. or P.M. <laughs> P.M. Two o'clock in the afternoon. It is weird. Friday, every every Friday, um, I do my final draft on on Friday morning. I'm almost done, done by noon. Almost always done by noon. And uh, then I work out. And then two o'clock, these guys come over. And um, it's my favorite part of the week. Um, and this is like this is like I have nothing high, but we smoke a cigar. And not well. We, yeah, we, one cigar we share it. <laughs> no, we smoke cigars. <laughs> And, and we just, and we talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And most of them are on staff, but they're not all on staff. Um, and everything comes up. I uh, mean, we're joking. We'll talk about everything. And um, I love these guys to death. And that's what I do back to you. But there's also other um, things. One of the things we try to do in our church is, is, is talk about, it's like kind of a pet peeve. Think, as churches, we sometimes, sorry, um, we have these ideas that should, people have to, if, if they're really good Christians, they have to come and be involved in our programs. Uh, one of the things I try to tell people is, is you know, most healthy people I know are in community. They're in it, right? And I want, I want to help people tend to take a step back and recognize the community they already have. And if you have it, don't be coming 
Don't begin in another small group. Recognize the community that you're in. Um, and so you get, and why don't you here on Wednesday night? You already have community, do that, and then figure out how that can become community. What I want to do as a church is help the people who don't know how to do that to do it. And, and um, so, uh, did I answer your question? This one round and round. Could you add by the question why you think that's important? Well, why that's important? Because I think, I don't think formation, I kids, I care about formation. And I don't think, I don't think real, I just think to, to really be known. I, we have a phrase we use at church a lot about allowing somebody to dig in your dirt. And um, um, I, I think that's where formation takes place. In relationship where you are letting people dig in your dirt. Um, I wish I had more time to talk about that phrase because it comes out of a parable. And I've had, I have example after example of people who have allowed me even in that group on Friday, to dig in their dirt, or to allow us, and people who haven't allowed us to dig in their dirt. Start digging in their dirt and they walk away. Um, um, but I'm telling you, that, that tree, this is the guy, the guy I'm thinking of, that guy, there's a guy named Joel, and um, the, the, the parable of digging in your dirt is the fig tree that doesn't have any life, and the guy wants to cut it down, and the gardener says, who's God, says, no, 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 no don't chop it down, give it some time. But throw on some manure, fertilizer, and dig in the dirt. And the dig in the dirt thing became this parable of, of just, you know, filling around with your junk. And um, this guy Joel made some mistakes, and he was in our group, and he actually he was on our staff, and we fired him. And he stayed in our group. We told him we, we wanted him to stay in the group because we loved him. And he stayed in the group, and we dug in the dirt. Joel, here's battle that was hot. And he went to counseling, and um, he didn't go away. And that guy's a different guy. That there's there's fruit on his fig tree. Yeah, there's fruit on his on his vine, and um, that's why. But not everybody will play. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe maybe we talk a little bit more about that on Thursday. And I also hope that we can have some conversations about because I know we're really committed to consecutive exposition. So yeah, yeah, it's all about teaching about that. Yeah. Okay. Let's express our appreciation. Later.